I knew Putin in two incarnations. Even in that second incarnation, he was brutal but calculating. My anxiety is we got a third. Britain's former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, has met Vladimir Putin several times and knows what it's like to negotiate with him. Tony Blair sat down with The Economist's editor-in-chief to give his take on how the West should deal with the Russian president. He deserves to be completely defeated. This global but divisive statesman told us Western foreign policy has lost its way. The wake-up call to the West has been going on for a long time. And that Western democracies must use this moment to get back on the front foot and shape the global balance of power. Tony Blair, thank you so much for joining us. So what about the evolution of Vladimir Putin? I mean, you've met him and you describe how early on you, you thought of him as a reformer. What do you think has happened? When I first met him, we offered a strong relationship with NATO precisely in order to allay Russian fears that, you know, NATO was about encircling Russia. Then over time, you noticed that he was removing all the democratic checks and balances within Russia. Um, you know, I was getting reports from uh, our intelligence people that, frankly, I didn't really take that seriously at the time, that the, he was accumulating the people around a massive personal wealth. And the anxiety, I think, that everyone has now is that he has become so detached from reality that, you know, you've got a, a, a new incarnation. The, the worry I have now with Putin is that he, is he capable of thinking rationally about this in a way that anyone else outside of that closed bubble that he in, inhabits can, can relate to. The war in Ukraine was a wake-up call for the West. Was it a wake-up call for you too, or did you see this coming? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't foresee this. But I think the, the, the wake-up call to the West has been going on for a long time. So even if we couldn't be sure what he was going to do, the West, in, in my view, has been essentially in retreat for, for over a decade. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is a problem for us, and we and we've got to deal with it. So let's let's talk about this Western retreat. There's lots of reasons for that, but one reason I think that many give is that it is essentially a legacy of Western overreach, particularly the war in Iraq. Do you think that the war that many people think was disastrous and illegal, the invasion of Iraq, has reduced appetite in the West for military intervention, and indeed did it embolden and strengthen Vladimir Putin? I don't think it emboldened or strengthened him. Whether you agreed or disagreed with the military action, we removed, Saddam Hussein removed the Taliban in order to replace it with a democratic process. Compare and contrast that with Putin. He went into Syria to prop up a dictator. There were chemical weapons used against the Syrian population by Assad. We, we took no action. So I think that's what he sees. Vladimir Putin is rightly, you know, his invasion has been called a crime of aggression. But, you know, many people called the Iraq invasion a crime of aggression. It didn't have UN sanctions. You hear this, you hear that the West has double standards. What do you say to that? I think what we've got to do is punch back very hard when people come at us with this. Okay, you may disagree with, with, with what was done, but compare getting rid of a brutal dictatorship and trying to replace it with a democracy. Okay, you can say that it was a flawed effort and, and there were failures attached to it, but that was, as it were, something supported, by the way, by the Iraqi people when they turned out to vote in the election. Compare and contrast that with literally invading a country that's no threat to you, whatever, and a country that's never proved any problem for anyone. Come on. What happened in Afghanistan last year? The nature of US withdrawal isn't there an argument that that could have emboldened Vladimir Putin because he thought he would get away with it? Yeah, sure it did, but the point is we didn't need to do it. We could have stayed there and we could have helped the country over a longer period of time. Now, of course, it, but that goes to the point right round the world you see this. I mean, my institute does a lot of work in Africa. You see, all over Africa, the, the influence now of, of China and now increasingly of Russia, the West is slow, it's bureaucratic, it doesn't work out how to build the right relationships. And yet many of these countries would prefer a relationship with America, with Western countries. So my point is a very simple one. It's that if the West wants to get back on the front foot, it's got to do a number of things that are really important. And they're all linked together by one concept, which is strategy. 
You've got to have a strategic, long-term view of the West and its place in the world. If you do that, then all the other things can flow from that and you can get back on the front foot again. Can there be a lasting peace with Putin in the Kremlin? I don't know. I don't think the... No, one, no one's going to believe any commitments that he gives, any assurances that he gives. And I do think out of this will come two things. One, I think this will prove his downfall eventually. That's my, my guess. I'm not saying it will happen immediately. But this is, he's turned Russia into a, a pariah state amongst the West, at least, and, and, and crippled his economy. But the second thing is that Ukraine will emerge as a stronger, more independent um, state, probably eventually a member of the European Union, I would say. Although so was, I think, was President Biden right when he said this man must go? Well, he was just expressing an emotional response. Look, I think most people are sitting there thinking, how, how can you do this? I mean, literally, how can you do this? And when you, the tales of these atrocities and Butcher and elsewhere come out and you see, I mean, 2022 on the doorstep of the European Union, it's, 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 it's evil, actually. But this does have sort of policy consequences because you, you can agree that it's very hard to see lasting peace with this man in, in the Kremlin, and also agree that regime change should not be the goal of Western policy. But what then should be the goal of Western policy vis-a-vis -vis Putin, given where he appears to be? You have to both um, ratchet up the pressure and try and get a structured negotiation and, and get a, an agreement that at least halts the hostilities. You know, he deserves to be completely defeated. But I think the longer this conflict goes on, that becomes extremely difficult. So I think I, I find it very hard to see how you, you, you make a deal now. Do you agree with President Zelensky that the West should be imposing tougher sanctions, particularly the Europeans, and there should be more weaponry, more offensive weaponry? Yes, I, I basically agree with that. I think you've got to toughen up the sanctions. I mean, the distinction between defensive and offensive weapons capabilities at a certain point becomes a bit meaningless. They need the ability to be able to push back hard um, on, the, uh, on the Russians. And that, I think, does require tanks, long-range missiles, other heavy artillery. Are Europeans insufficiently prepared to suffer themselves for this? I mean, do you think there is a sense of the stakes? Well, there, there will be some anxiety, but we all are going to suffer some short-term pain. Look, Europe has come together in a pretty remarkable way, but we're going to have to go further. And the, the, the risk, the principal risk now, is escalation. Um, because if you can't find a way to bring the conflict to an end, and it's clear that Putin is going to struggle to win this militarily, the question is how desperate does he become? What's your um, assessment of President Zelensky and his um, leadership of this war effort and his um, ability to you know, harness, in some sense, the spirit of Ukraine so powerfully globally. You know, this was a defining moment for him and he, he did something that was both incredibly brave and, and obviously um, extraordinarily powerful as a, as a drawing together of people under the banner of democracy. Let's talk a bit about the longer term consequences of this. Do you think this is a defining moment for the West and for sort of global geopolitical balances of power? It is a wake up call for the West, but it should make us think very carefully about what we need to do for the future. And that's why I say it's about strategy. You know, we need to build our defense capabilities. Um, we need to make sure that we are um, building our alliances, the, the transatlantic alliance has got to be revived and made strong, I mean really strong. We have got to have a, a coherence of policy across the peace so that, you know, those people who are our allies, we're, we're standing with them, we're helping them. But above all else, we should have confidence in our, in, in our own system. And, you know, we haven't. You know, the politics of the U.S. Is in the last... Yes, has been, you know, to be honest, it's been a mess and it's been a problem. I mean, there is a, you know, a non-negligible possibility that Donald Trump wins the election in 2024. So can you be sure about, you know, the US being where it is right now in terms of its position on 
Ukraine and Putin? Look, we'll have to accept whatever the US decides to do. I mean, his people are elected, but I, mean, I have no idea whether that will happen or not, or whether he's even going to stand. But the point is, whoever is the president, I, I think after what has happened, whoever is the president is going to recognize that they need to build strong alliances, you know, irrespective of what's been said in the past. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too worried about that no matter what happens. And the second part of your, your strategy was um, building the alliances more broadly. But if you look at countries from India to Saudi Arabia to the UAE to large numbers of countries in Africa, they have not been part of this anti-Putin alliance. They have not really come out in support of Ukraine in any meaningful way. I think it's a spur to us to think strategically. Look, if you're India, you've got Pakistan next door to it, it's got um, China, which is a constant presence on its border with, with skirmishes. You know, if you're India, you, you need to, to build your defense capability. So maybe we should be asking the question of why, why have the Indians gone to Russia and not, and not come to us? And then when you look at the Middle East, if you're one of the Middle East countries at the moment, you're thinking your big threat is, is Iran. And are we really helping stand up to that threat or not? And in Africa, you know, as I say, the, the fact is, if you're, if you're in the Sahel group of countries, you see the, these, uh, the R Russia moving in there. I mean, the Sahel group of countries is a, a, a group of countries where it's absolutely vital for the West to be seen to act and to be acting against this um, jihadist extremism uh, and all the problems that, that, that those countries have. If, if we don't act, by the way, we're going to get floods of migration from those countries and big problems of extremism. But we're not there. So Xi Jinping is often thought of as having a strategy and a much bigger, longer-term vision for China's rise. This, this partnership with Russia now and, and the very clear decision that he has made not to criticise Russia, does it mean we're going to be in a kind of alliance of autocracies? Or how do you see that? Well, again, it's one of the things I've learned since leaving office is how important it is not to see this always from a Western point of view. And... You know, from the Chinese point of view, they, you know, they regard themselves and indeed are a major, major power. They look after their own interests. If China believes that the West is irretrievably hostile and is looking to disengage, to leave China alone, to put it, as it were, to the side, I don't think that's possible or sensible. But if they think that, then of course they've got no interest in alienating Russia because they want to pull Russia into their orbit. China's not going to allow Russia to determine policy. I mean, Russia will be the very junior partner in this relationship. So we've also got to take a complete view. What is our relationship with China going to be? That is the defining question of 21st century geopolitics. We can't be sure whether in the future it's going to be merely a competitor or as most people I think in the West now think, it's going to be our opponent and possibly even, according to some people, our enemy. Does that mean that you think the West's current strategy towards China is the wrong one? The West has got to be strong enough militarily to do whatever is necessary to deal with whatever comes out of China. But you've also got to understand that divorcing ourselves from China, not engaging, is, I, I don't think it's either possible or sensible. You've got to understand a power like China. You've got to be, you've got to be in a position where lines of communication remain open. I understand why you don't want economic interaction on technology or companies with a security um, impact. But other than that, is it really sensible for us to to separate, to decouple from China? I don't, I don't think so. So is this lack of strategy, why is it that there isn't the kind of strategic approach that you're advocating right now? I think politics has become much, much harder because if you want to pursue a strategy, that's long-term. And to pursue it effectively, it's got to be consistent over a period of years. What's happened in, in the politics of the West over these past years, there's been this you know, surge of populism, there's been splintering off to the far right, to the far left. What will it take for this ghastly invasion and its aftermath to be the catalyst, if you will, for the kind of rethinking, strategic rethinking that you're calling for? I'm horrified by what's happening in Ukraine, but long term out of this, I think what's happened demonstrates the value 
of a liberal democracy. And it also will stimulate, I believe, a, a revaluation from the West of how it positions itself. And my hope is, within our internal politics in the West, you know, those, that populism that I think has done a huge amount of damage to our position and our standing is in retreat. So the long-term prospects for liberal democracy, I think, have been amply demonstrated as, as positive. I hope you're right. Tony Blair, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to find out more about our forthcoming subscriber events or watch previous discussions, please click the link. See you next time.